Great, guys. Um, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Pennsylvania Council of Teachers of Mathematics Virtual Conference. PCTM would also like to acknowledge the wonderful partnership we have with Patton uh, to help make this conference possible. We appreciate the partnership with them this year and look forward to working with them again in the near future. While we wish we could have been in person at Patton Harrisburg today, we have a unique opportunity this morning to connect with over 850 attendees, and actually I believe the number is 867 as of this morning, from 40 different states, 19 different countries, and five continents. Unbelievable. Our theme this year is building mathematical connections in, in Pennsylvania and around the globe. Couldn't be more fitting based on the attendance list this year. With many of us having to remain socially distant and not being able to connect in person, the conference will serve as the best means possible considering the world events. Please feel free to use the hashtag PCTMVirtual to share your experiences today, as we will highlight some tweets on our Twitter account. We hope that you'll enjoy today's conference. This morning, we're going to kick off the conference with a talk from Sunil Singh. Sunil was a high school math teacher and physics teacher for 19 years. He has taught at every grade level and in every situation imaginable, from the socioeconomic challenges in the tough urban schools in Toronto to an international baccalaureate school in Switzerland. His views on the purpose and potential for learning mathematics have been strongly shaped in this wide domain of experiences that all students are capable of loving mathematics. Sunil has viewed mathematics as an adventure of his entire life and now mathematics is providing adventures for him in writing and traveling. He has given over 50 presentations on creative mathematics all over North America, including the Royal Conservatory of Mathematics in Toronto and the Museum of Mathematics in New York. Not only is the author of Pie of Life, The Hidden Happiness of Mathematics and Math Recess, Playful Learning in an Age of Disruption, but he was also a regular writer for the New York Times number play section. He's also a co-editor at QED, a very popular blog for disruptive math writing and has been a guest on several math podcasts. He's been an invited, featured, and major speaker at math conferences such as NCTM, NCSM, and the Fields Institute in, Tor in Toronto. He serves on the board of directors of the Human Restoration Project, and his next book, Chasing Rabbits, A Curious Guide to a Lifetime of Mathematical Wellness, comes out next year. He is strongly committed to bringing math history and rich storytelling to K-12 math classrooms all over North America with his work with Amplify and Mathagon. And with that, it is my honor to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Sunil Singh. Sunil, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so first, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to share my screen and make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, so uh, again, just a little bit of a housekeeping check. Uh, people can hear me and hopefully people can see my screen now. You're good on my end. I'll take a look in the chat and see if there's anyone with an issue. Sure. We're getting a lot of all goods and yeses. So I think we are all set. Perfect. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you for uh, to PCTM, um, Patan, uh, for supporting this uh, conference. Uh, a special thanks to Bob Lochel, who was the first person from PCTM to reach out to me last year. Um, I was actually sitting um, at a workshop in uh, San Antonio uh, when I officially got the notification that I would be a keynote speaker for this event. And naturally, you have a lot of thoughts running through your head. You know, uh, what are you going to talk about? I had an idea I was going to talk about storytelling. But I was also looking forward to going to Pennsylvania. It would have been the first time in Pennsylvania for me since my family took a road trip in 1977 to go to Washington, D.C. So I was looking forward to Pennsylvania, exploring the town of Harrisburg, meeting with new friends and kindred spirits in math education, um, letting the ideas of the keynote marinate over the two-day conference and have conversations at breakfast, lunch, dinner, in the hallway, wherever, in the parking lot. And so obviously that's not happening. However, as uh, was mentioned, we have people from, you know, 40 states and so many different countries. So I should be saying good morning to all of you, uh, a good early morning to the people on the West Coast and uh, a good afternoon and a good evening to all the people 
in Easter um, Europe and uh, Asia. So we should take advantage of this situation to connect uh, with each other through a virtual medium, which we would not have had if there wasn't a pandemic, uh, which also means that the idea of this keynote, storytelling, the journey of rehumanizing mathematics for all, that's something that has more urgency now because we have temporarily lost our connections. We are temporarily in this sort of bubble state. So what ideas will we bring to math education, not just for the future, but uh, in the short term present, when we sort of start getting back to school and dealing with all those anxieties as a teacher, um, what's school gonna look like? So once we take care of the safety issues, the social emotional issues, which are very important, what is math education going to look like? So here's a question I want you to sort of hover above your head like a, you know, uh, like a cloud. Um, you know, what was your first big math story memory? And uh, I want you to think about that question as I go through uh, my keynote. And I want you to maybe audit it in terms of, you know, what resources did I have to tell that story? Um, uh, what resources would I like to have to further color um, those stories? And you can see in the picture on the right hand side, um, there's a, a picture of uh, the Bromian rings. And you know, there's a story of you, there's a story of mathematics, and the story of your students. And if you take one of those rings away, it all falls apart. So uh, the storytelling has to be all interconnected. So I want you to think about that as I sort of go through this talk in terms of, and what I mean by your first big story, you know, it can be anything that sort of had an impact on you in terms of um, your perceptions of mathematics, um, how you view mathematics as a teacher, any lens you want to use for um, that particular question and answering it. And we'll circle back to that uh, at the end. This was um, probably the most important picture for me to pick. And I want to pick a picture that conveyed um, that it was famous and but also perhaps unknown and was personal to me. And so what this picture is, uh, without even knowing the names, it really conveys storytelling. Now there's two questions I could ask you about this picture. And they seem similar, but they have two different answers. If I ask you, who are the storytellers in this picture? The answer is both these people. Because for storytelling to continue, you have to have someone who listened to the story and then continues that story um, to the next person or next generation. Uh, this is uh, a picture taken in 1968. Um, the person on the left-hand side is Mans Lipscomb, uh, a blues musician. And on the right is uh, a relatively young Charles Strachwitz, um, who is still with us. And uh, he founded uh, Arhuli Records. Uh, and this is a store that him in the store, a relatively recent picture uh, in San Francisco. And what I want to alert you to is the sort of the collage of pictures on the right hand side. Um, it's okay if you can't see those individual album covers, but what Charles Strachwich has done for 60 years and continues to do is he tells the story of untold stories of American music. Blues, soul, Zydeco, Tex-Mex, uh, Latino, all the music that you would find in your kitchens, in those people's kitchens, their backyards, their porches. And when you put all these artists together and you make a collage, you bring life to that story. And again, I, you know, all these artists, um, many of them I had never even heard of. And that's the point of storytelling, to tell the stories of those who may not have a voice. And Charles Strachwitz gave that voice. However, I didn't come across Charles by accident. Someone told his story. And these two women here 
are the directors of a movie called This Ain't No Mouse Music, came out in 2013, a documentary of his life, uh, Chris Simon and Maureen Gosling. So the idea of storytelling, the, the idea of uncovering, the idea of sharing uh, is such an important piece in this story. And I think you're already starting to see the parallels in terms of how important it is to tell math stories. But we're not going to get there just yet. We need to talk about one more important storyteller of our generation. This is someone you, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with. Now, what I love about this picture, again, it's the same idea. You can tell who is doing the storytelling and you can tell who's doing the attentive listening. You need to have an active, attentive, enthusiastic listener for that story to continue, to be told. So how did Anthony Bourdain come to make that proclamation that Senegal is the jewel of the world? He didn't just read about Senegal. He traveled to Senegal. He talked to the people in Senegal. He sat down with them on uh, benches like this and listened to their stories. That's how we get to the kernel, the truth about anything. So again, this is what's important as we go forward in math education. This quote um, is from uh, Anthony Bourdain's first show, A Cook Store. And I love this quote um, because you know, it was a sort of a harbinger of things to come, which he didn't even know back in 2002, 2003, you know, as a cook. Well, let's change cook to math educator, mathematician. What are your memories? And are you in search of new ones? Are you in search of new stories? And I use this boat that he's on in Vietnam, the Mekong Delta, I believe. How do you, how do we uh, metaphorically, symbolically get on this boat of math education? Are we willing to take those risks to get and dig into math stories and math history? We have nothing to lose. So stories become more powerful as we transcend generations. And I've picked two particular stories uh, one you may be not so familiar with, and one, especially of kids like I do, um, you've seen uh, Coco, the 2017 uh, film by Pixar. But the first one is the Kabuluwali, uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, who was a, a prolific uh, Bengali poet, writer, uh, painter as well. And he was the first non-European, the first non-European to win a Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913. And I like the first story because it's about an older person trying to get a younger person to remember him. And in Coco, you have kind of the flip situation where you have a younger person trying to get an older person to remember. And, you know, remember is such a key idea in uh, the storytelling idea. And, you know, the mathematics uh, is the same thing, except we have a lot bigger timeline to contend with. Uh, we have over 100 generations of stories to tell, which means that this has to be one, it has to be a journey. It has to be a collective journey. We all have to do our part to tell stories. And again, they can be stories of mathematics. They can be stories of our students. They can be stories of ourselves where they're experience of mathematics. But this is the whole sort of a, you know, bouillabaisse soup that we are in to uh, give the richness to mathematics. And what I did was, um, I, and I pulled this somewhat at random. Um, so from the Mathagon timeline that you saw on the previous slide, I pulled 18 mathematicians. Uh, at some uh, sort of randomness, I just definitely want to highlight uh, people that you may not have seen or recognized. And I want to get a sort of a whole sort of vast array of 
uh, pictures of cultures, of customs, um, some uh, color portraits, some black and white, some sketches, some sort of sculptures and busts. And that itself conveys this wonderful collage of history, just the transition as we move from century to century. And you know what's really important? Is beyond giving uh, recognition through pictures, it's really important to give their names. So going across the top of the screen from left to right, you have Al Krismi, you have Aryabhata, you have Basquera, you have Germain, Agnesi, Galois, Xingyi, Mirzakhani, Siji, Al Haytham, Nightingale, Hypatia of Alexandria, Pingala, Nother, Lovelace, Easley, Brahmagupta, and Nulembeck. You see what I've done? I've given names to those people. I've given identity. It gives attribution. It elevates their prominence in terms of math history and storytelling. And speaking of collage, uh, here's another sort of group, <laughs> a group shot. Um, this is a Canadian company that was probably the first company to actually start to infuse math history in their platform. Um, they're located in Montreal, Quebec, and even just these nine photographs. And, you know, there's so many mathematicians, such a wonderful job of, you know, having various races and gender representation, even the nine. And you put them all together and you start to sort of build that sort of mysticism, mythology, uh, and lore, which is so critical in, in telling math stories. This is a slide I could have put anywhere in the presentation. But if you get right down to sort of, you know, uh, brass tacks, this is what storytelling does. If you want to involve people at the deepest level, at the, at the deepest level, at the cellular level of how you want them to react emotionally, um, hopefully, um, this is what storytelling does. And the campfire sort of motif symbolism, I, I mean, I, I almost feel like that I'm giving this uh, talk uh, around this large campfire, at least in my head. Uh, that's the intimacy you want to convey um, when you're telling stories. So I'll give you an example of how powerful storytelling can be. Um, with an actual group of people. So there's a group of people, uh, a hunter-gatherer uh, people uh, in the Philippines called uh, the Agta. And uh, they have a two stories and they're very short. But look at what storytelling does. So in this picture here, um, uh, sort of this sort of painting uh, mural, um, you have a male and a female. And what it's supposed to convey is they're having a dispute, they're having a, a discussion argument of who should illuminate the sky. And so the sun, uh, the male uh, says, uh, you know, I want to, you know, illuminate and the moon, the female, I know I want to illuminate. So they come to a compromise where the sun uh, will illuminate during the day and the moon at night. And this story is told um, in, in this uh, group, uh, these people to convey gender equality. And so often we think about, you know, past uh, peoples and tribes and cultures, civilizations as me, maybe not being as evolved. That's not true. There was a certain egalitarianism to these people about uh, things like gender equality. Uh, and the second story I uh, love also is, uh, it's about a story between a wild pig and a sea cow. And uh, they're friends and they would race every day together until the sea cow hurt its legs. And then the wild pig took the sea cow to the water and so the sea cow could swim and the wild pig could run on land and they continued to race forever. That story, would it take 30 seconds? It conveys friendship. It conveys cooperation. It conveys empathy. And it conveys an aversion to inequality. And that is why stories are told in general in hunter-gatherer tribes is to pass on attributes, traits, um, ambitions, and ideas which are best for the people. So what about mathematics? What is the purpose there? And why, why am I telling all these stories? 
Well, the teacher that most influenced me as a math educator, math teacher, was my high school teacher, Mr. Scott. And that had a profound impact, especially, um, it was almost dormant uh, in the last sort of 10 years, you know, how important the idea of re me remembering stories, me wanting to learn stories uh, became so powerful. And if you want to get down to really, you know, a really a one word answer, why we're, you know, telling math stories. Well, if we don't tell them, and this is Janaid Mabin's piece in 2017, um, you know, if you don't teach math history, it's soulless. So I feel like we should be like Charles Strachwitz. We are looking for the soulful mathematics, just like he looked for soulful music. We're looking for soulful mathematics and trying to put that back in. So I think that is really important. So I've kind of done this a little bit backwards and I've never switched it around. Usually you, you first uh, showcase a book and then you maybe um, highlight a passage. I'm highlighting a passage from the book first. Some of you might have seen this before and know the, the title of this book, but I've marked, this is my own marking of the book. And you can see that right away, that first sentence, an interest in history marks us for life. It does. And there's a, there's a blue underline, justification, that seems to be important. So I created this sort of trajectory what storytelling does. First of all, when you start to tell stories, you start the idea of humanizing your space. Um, there's trust. And after that, I believe, is belonging. And I want you to remember that word, even though it's not the last word, I want you to remember the word belonging. And then lastly, the idea of fostering curiosity. That's how you get to curiosity when all those other things are in place. So the book this is from is, for me, one of the greatest references for math history. Um, it's called Crest of the Peacock. Uh, three editions have come out now, um, the non-European roots of mathematics. And this is quite the compendium of everything that you need to know about um, the non-European roots and the trajectory that it got into in terms of connecting with Europe. So even if you're not a high school teacher, um, I strongly, strongly recommend um, that you have access to this book just so you can see where a lot of the ideas came from and sort of were originally given birth to. So this is the crest of the peacock. So remember what I said about that third word, belonging? Because sort of the opposite of belonging um, is the negative idea of alienation. And uh, Peter Taylor, who is a professor at uh, Queen's University, um, he came up with this idea, which I strongly believe in, that alienation in mathematics occurs uh, you know, before difficulty, which means alienation occurs before anxiety. Anxiety is almost the metastasis of alienation. By the time we get to math anxiety, I think it's almost too late. There's so much damage that has been done to students' confidence. Um, you know, it's, it's so late in the game. We never talk about alienation. But alienation is the first thing which happens, the precursor to anxiety. So how do we avoid alienation? Well, of course, we want belonging. And how do we get belonging? Well, we have to tell stories, right? We have to tell stories. So here are what I think um, three of the best math stories of our generation. Uh, from left to right, uh, we have Keith Devlin, and uh, hopefully Keith is joining us uh, from uh, Palo Alto uh, this morning, a very early morning for him. Uh, Marcus de Satoy in the center and Simon Singh. And uh, this picture was actually given to me by uh, Keith, and there's a wonderful story about it. It's taken in 2004, September 2004, and uh, they're all there to uh, discuss um, the, the millennium problems, um, the history of them, uh, the Riemann hypothesis, the, the Poincaré conjecture. So, you know, when they say every picture is a thousand, you know, you know, thousand words, I mean, there's a story behind this. And so we have not only great writers, uh, but we also have great uh, speakers uh, who tell stories of mathematics. And, you know, uh, for, if you want to know about the birth of algebra, sure, you could read stuff, but to hear the voice, to hear Keith Devlin's voice 
talked about the birth of algebra with all those pauses, inflections, and uh, points of enthusiasm. That's the key thing about storytelling. It has to come from your mouth to really have that impact. So here's Marcus. Uh, he's, I, I love this picture and I love this quote. Uh, he's reading a really small book. He's at the Jaipur uh, Literature Festival, which is the largest literature festival in the world. I think it was from last year. And that's really what the power of stories are. Um, it's that sort of uh, interstitial space that glue which connects us to what is possible. And so of course he's talking about the sciences, but this also pertains to mathematics as well. Uh, the Siobhan Roberts is also another great storyteller. Um, she's written two amazing books about uh, uh, two great mathematicians, Donald Cox, who's Canadian, uh, who passed away at the ripe old age of 101, 101, back in 2001. And unfortunately we also lost John Conway this year as well. Um, and she's written two beautiful books about these people. Now, what I want to share with you uh, is, is one of their views of the book on Coxeter. And I want you to look at some of the language that's used. And you can see right away, there is the two words, compelling story. And when you have a compelling story, then all those other words like beautiful and exalting um, can be folded in. And that's why storytelling is important because it really conveys our humanity and it conveys the beauty uh, of these people and, and the world of mathematics in which they inhabited for you know, so many, many years. You can't find this picture of uh, John Conway. It's a screenshot. It's not a very good one. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy. Uh, it occurs at the 39 minute mark of a talk he gave the University of Toronto on serial numbers. And I, I think you can guess why I took this screenshot. He's on the verge of tears. And I think the first time I saw it, um, I think I shed a tear or two because it was very unexpected. And you might think that he's uh, feeling emotional, maybe because of life. Um, he's had, he had some challenges in his life. No, he's telling a mathematical story. Um, he's talking about Cantor. And he's talking about, not Cantor's set theory, but he's talking about how Cantor, along with uh, Felix Klein, founded uh, the International Math Union back in the late 1800s. And also then organized the first International Math Congress in Zurich in 1897. So why, why is he getting emotional here? Because he's telling the story that it, the French delegation wasn't going to show up. And that would have been very sad. And he then communicates the story that the French delegation led by Poincaré did show up and everyone started clapping. And he's actually in this video. He starts to clap too. And that's when he starts to tear up. And he continues to tell stories a couple minutes later, forgetting he's talking about serial numbers, which is the focus of his talk. And this is the point which is so important. He says, I find these mathematical stories more interesting than the mathematics. John Horton Conway, who was a mathematical giant in our world, is telling the audience with still tears in his eyes that these stories are more important than the mathematics. So I think that is something that, uh, you know, we should definitely take heed when we have these great mathematicians saying that the stories that they tell eclipse quite often the mathematics. Uh, here's a kind of a, you know, a nice sort of a, a jocular interlude. Uh, Donald Coxeter, who uh, Shaban Roberts, you know, wrote that biography about, and I got a picture of the Rolling Stones cover. Uh, these two people, uh, especially Mick Jagger and Coxter, are connected. I'm not going to go into the story, but this, this is the other part about storytelling. It never ends. It gets every, if you go, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're going to find all these wonderful connections. And so one of the wonderful connections I found when I was digging into Coxter myself is that he is actually connected to the Rolling Stones um, and this album cover they put out, which was, I think, the first 
uh, non-square album cover was going to actually have deeper geometric meaning. And I just, I want you to do a little bit of digging on your own. I don't want to give it all away. So just Google uh, Mick Jagger, Rolling Stones, Donald Coxeter, and just see what comes up. I want you to find your own stories because that's, that's, that's half the fun as well. So here we are. This is what the power of told does, right? This is a movie uh, that I think many of us see now. Um, the, the characters, uh, the people um, we all know about, we've brought into our classrooms. This is what we do when we tell stories. Yes, they're untold, whether they be math stories, music stories, but as soon as we tell them, we give power to these people. And that continues the legacy of these people who might not have ever had a legacy if it wasn't for their stories being told. And here's another sort of famous movie that was made uh, about Ramana John, which you might have seen. You know, uh, Ramana John was born in a you know, poor village, uh, Erode, India, about 250 miles southwest of Madras at the time, which is now Chennai. And, you know, he lived a very short life and, you know, in his last year where, you know, he was riddled with pain. Um, many people said he did as much mathematics on his sickbed that an average mathematician would do in their life. And so much of the mathematics and physics um, that he discovered would sort of come out later, 30, 40, 50 years later. And, you know, one of the things they said about him was that even though he was so mathematically brilliant, they put an asterisk almost behind everything he did because of his, he was a devout Hindu. And uh, because he sort of attributed everything to God and, you know, he, he, that idea was looked down by the West, um, you know, by Hardy, because uh, it was sloppy and, you know, he, it, something had to be more sort of rooted in proof and axiomatic ideas of mathematics. And yet he was giving away all this sort of, um, you know, talent to uh, religious deity. Well, isn't that biased too? For whatever reason one wants to go into mathematics, whatever culture, race, civilization, wherever they've come from, if they've gone into mathematics, and remember, everyone went into mathematics, prior to education, freely and passionately before education. So this idea of uh, giving sort of, you know, religious attribution, we should not mock. And in fact, uh, David Crummels, who played Charlie Epps on that show Numbers, which I'm hoping might have, many of you have seen, and you can't find this quote. This is quote was a, in a DVD uh, as part of an extra of season one. You know, here we have an actor who was actually a, a failure, uh, who failed math classes. You have a failed math student who through the medium of art, of acting, is actually saying the same thing that Ramana John said, that rare piece of connecting mathematics to a higher plane spirituality. So, you know, we have to, again, the idea of storytelling is to bring soulfulness to ourselves, to mathematics, and eventually into our uh, math communities and our classrooms. So here's the part uh, where I actually tell a story. And there's so many math stories I could tell, but this is the one, this is my favorite. This is my favorite math story to tell. And I know many of you have heard of Sophie Germain and her story, but I, I doubt you've heard someone tell the story, which I'm gonna do right now. And this is my version of the story. This is sort of what I think the salient points are. I mean, if you go to Wikipedia, you're gonna find a whole bunch of other details. This is me cobbling together all the Sophie Germain things and it becomes Sunil's story. And if you hear it, it's gonna become your story and you wanna take whatever part. So let's go, you know, 1789, Paris, France. The Bastille has just fallen. And Sophie Germain is 13 years old. Right there, the, the confluence and the streets are unsafe because the revolution is afoot. Right there, if there is no French Revolution, do we have a Sophie Germain? Because she still plays outside as a normal 
13 year old out in the streets of Paris, France. But because the streets are dangerous, she's sheltering in, you know, much like us, um, but she's also bored. So she sort of uh, stumbles, across her, uh, stumbles across her father's library of books. And uh, she uh, comes across a book by Jean and Tien Montcullia, um, Les uh, Histoire de Mathematiques, History of Mathematics, where she discovers the story of the supposed death of Archimedes, uh, who was supposedly so engrossed in a geometry problem um, that he ignored a, a, a warning and a soldier of Syracuse um, killed him. Now that's supposedly the story. But you have a 13-year-old girl who's like completely floored by the fact of how, how engrossing can a math problem be? That someone is going to, uh, you know, fail to acknowledge the safety around them and, you know, uh, succumb to uh, someone and they will look and kill them. I mean, think about that, how much that sparked her curiosity. And sure enough, she started to uh, not only read math books in the father's library, but started to read, uh, she taught herself Greek and Latin so she could um, read the works of Schweizig Newton and Euler. And her parents disapproved. So at night, she wasn't given like a fire or warm clothes. So she would take candles and quilts, wrap herself up. Can you imagine the picture of this 13 year old underneath some quilts with a candle, teaching herself, you know, these languages and mathematics? It's almost a story you would not believe, except that it's true. And then five years later, um, the Ecole Polytechnique opens up. She's 18. Um, you don't have to attend the, uh, the, the school, but uh, you can have access to the uh, lecture notes, but uh, at that time, women uh, were not allowed to uh, partake. So she takes on the name of a former student, uh, Monsieur de Blanc, uh, nom de plume, and uh, she starts to correspond. And th there's a famous mathematician there at Lagrange who is so taken aback by uh, Sophie's work, Monsieur de Blanc, and who was the first person that sort of caught uh, uh, the eye of Sophie in terms of the, 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 the quality of her work. And then if we just fast forward, you know, five, six years later, um, you know, Gauss, uh, who's just, I think, about a year or two younger than Germain, is, is doing some amazing work in number theory. And that's where Sophie Germain's passion starts to lie. And she communicates with uh, Gauss as well. But Gauss doesn't respond back to her. And then fate would have it. Like, the story doesn't, it's so magnificent. Uh, let's go to 1807. Um, you know, the, the, the Napoleonic Wars are happening. And uh, the, the French have occupied the German town of Braschweig. And uh, that's where Gauss is holed up. And Sophie is fearing for his life, the same thing that maybe happened to Archimedes. So they contact a personal family friend who's a general. Can you please watch out for Gauss? I don't want him to get killed. Turns out Gauss was fine, but he's confused as to why Sophie Germain got involved here. Finally, Sophie conveys to Gauss who I really am. And then Gauss pens back one of the most amazing letters congratulating Sophie on her full confession and that you must have the noblest courage, extraordinary talent, and superior genius. That letter should be inside the cover of every math textbook because it emboldens uh, a female at a time where females were not uh, championed to go into the sciences. And uh, Gauss even honored her uh, uh, six years after her death when she died of breast cancer in 1831. And all these details are important. All these details are important. The dates, um, the unfortunate early death uh, due to breast cancer, it humanizes Sophie Germain, it humanizes her connection to Gauss. And there we have it. How do, we lure, how do I lure you? How do we lure our students? into the layer of mathematics. It's lore. Just like the story I just told you. Just like the story I just told you in terms of Sophie Germain. And as you saw in that timeline, which was, you know, I shared back about 15 minutes ago, there are so many stories to tell. And I can't tell them all. Neither can you. But collectively, and that's why it's a journey for all of us. Um, we're all on this journey together. So when you tell a math story, let's say if you were to tell the story of um, uh, cell phone antennas, cell phones, 
because with the, without the idea of fractals, you cannot, uh, we not, we not had cell phones uh, in terms of when they were sort of first thought of in the early 90s. Because if we didn't have the idea of the fractals, our antenna for, on a cell phone would you know, be about six feet long and have all these jaggedy things sticking out. But because of the mathematical idea of fractals, we can have that, and that you can see that sort of um, antenna inside the cell phone. But if you want to tell the full story, you've got to go back 500 years and talk about something like the Ethiopian cross, which is also fractal design, because fractals are indigenous to Africa. Yes, fractals are indigenous to Africa in terms of um, their jewelry, in terms of their social hierarchy structure, in their fabric, everything in so many different countries in Africa are rooted in this idea of self-similarity. And if, again, to tell the whole story of mathematics, if you're gonna go into fractals, and as you should, because they're so beautiful, it's really important to go back into the history. And again, it invites that curiosity. There's that C word again. Uh, I'd probably say it three or four times, probably say it three or four more before I'm done, because really that's the punctuation mark that we must all eventually get to. So how do we do it? How do we take um, the idea uh, from a macro to a micro level into our classrooms? Well, the first thing is we must, we must ground any unit that we teach in a compelling storyline. And whether that's found for us or by us, it is the starting point. And every single piece of mathematics that you present in your classroom, trust me, has a compelling story because mathematics started somewhere. Whether it's just simple counting or complex algebra, you can find its roots. And again, it can't just be one person, can't be me, can't be a couple. It has to be collective, all of us trying to uh, create a compendium of resources so we can share all of this stuff together. Well, after that, what do you have to do? You have to also situate the problem in a meaningful uh, context, which is relevant to students. You know, the sensibilities of our students, you know, they're, they're growing up in this time period um, with this social media, with these stresses, with, you know, whatever joys they have, whatever interest they have. We have to find as much of, if it's a Venn diagram, their interest to overlap the mathematics because that's where we wanna get them right at the beginning because if we're eventually gonna get, get them to the curiosity point, um, we have to place them in a spot where they can identify themselves, um, where they feel safe, and they feel valued, and they feel reflected. And that's what storytelling and math history does. It reflects everybody in terms of their uh, space. And then, you know, what's also important is we have to make space for connection and reflection. Like you also have to give time out. Like after they've seen the mathematics, let kids think about what they've seen. Give them space, give them a day or two to think about a math problem. Come back and then see what they've pulled out from um, the math problems and the stories which they're immersed in. And then there's again that curiosity word. That's how we get them at the end to spark them with tales of mathematics so that they can continue this cycle. And that's why you know, a company like Amplify is trying to do this in terms of finding the compelling story and narrative and placing that up front with images, with ideas, so that it is inclusive, that students do want to participate in the mathematics individually, collaboratively, and with their teachers. So we're almost coming to the end and we're sort of pulling back out on a macro level. I've chosen two pictures which look very similar. One on the left-hand side is a, a piece, uh, art piece done by Caspar Friedrich called Wander Above the Sea, uh, late 1890s, sort of the German romantic period of painting. And you also have this sort of hiker, same thing. You're, you're at this sort of cliff and it's maybe the clouds and the fog represent the current state that we're in. However, this is the time to take 
the risk that we need so that what we go through to the other side carries the most sort of um, uh, enthusiastic exploratory ideas of mathematics. And, you know, we should act as Buckminster Fuller at this point, because, you know, the best way to change something is to build something new. And I think it's important to build something new again together. Uh, wherever we are, even though we're isolated, um, we are connecting in something even like a, a conference here today. And even over the course of the day, we're going to we're going to inspire each other and we're going to come out with new ideas and we have to build this new reality because really we're at this stage. It's binary. It's mathematics, humanity or bust. We have two choices. We can either go bust or we can go towards the vector of humanity, which I believe storytelling and math history does take us. And remember, I put that journey right in the beginning of that title slide. Um, well, if you look at this Neil Peart quote, um, the journey is not to arrive. Don't worry about getting to the end. Be in the moment. Have your arms out. Enjoy the ride. It's almost like Samuel Beckett's waiting for Godot. Never going to arrive, but that's okay. We are in the moment. Be in the moment with your colleagues. Be in the moment with your students. Um, take the pressure off. You're never going to arrive. And so what kind of reality are we going to build? Of course, we're going to build the reality closer to the heart if we're going to finish the idea of Neil Peart, right? Close to the heart means um, something is emotional, something which is soulful. And again, it's all wrapped in a nice sort of Gordian knot in storytelling. And, you know, one of the last slides I want to leave you with as we're really pulling out to macro, this is a, a statue of Phil Lynott, one of my favorite artists in uh, Harry Street in Grafton Square in Dublin, Ireland. And this is a quote, a lyric from the Black Rose, which is actually a very rare rose, which has a lot of sort of mystical powers going back to ancient Rome. But the line that I like about this is someone who was so enamored with Irish and Celtic mythology, so I can teach my children oh. This is what storytelling does. Reminds me of a Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young song, teach your children, teach your children well. So let's find, save, carry, teach our math stories for future generations. As we walk through this pandemic, please let's walk through it lightly. And even though stories carry so much weight in terms of what they can do to our classrooms, there's a lightness and that's what we should bring over to the other side. That's what we should bring over and everything else, which is rooted in 20th century ideas of math education, you know, we should just let them burn away. So please keep in mind that first question I told you at the beginning, what was your first big math story memory? Hashtag it, you can connect with me. I wanna keep this uh, conversation going. Um, look for something in the fall. Um, I will do a webinar so we can go re even more into the micro, into our classrooms. Um, so uh, if you're on Twitter, please keep an eye for that. And uh, please, uh, yeah, remember to hashtag PCTM virtual and PCTM 2020. Thank you so much. Have an absolutely amazing day connecting with all your colleagues, whether they be in state, out of state, out of country. And let's continue the conversation on Twitter today. Thank you so much.